Welcome everyone. This is our Barriers for Breakfast uh, special edition event during ASU GSD Summit. Uh, thrilled to have our colleagues today, David Lipkin from Lift Learning and also Monica White from Elevate Academy. Uh, so nice to get uh, fellow CEOs together, people working on uh, you know, assessment of and for learning in the space, particularly through what we've learned with COVID. And so I was thrilled to get you both on a call because, you know, I felt like this person shouting in the wilderness before COVID that competency-based learning and the ability to have learners lead their own discovery and their own journeys was so important. And then I think, you know, for many of us, we had kind of a finally moment, like, COVID presented an opportunity for us to really think very deeply about that and how we could kind of reshape the notion of what schooling and learning should be. So we're here today to talk about assessment next. You know, let's not, let's not waste a good crisis. Let's make sure that we came through this and we're doing some things that are really interesting. So I'm going to, you know, start with David and kind of give him kind of the big why platform. Why are you in this work? Why do you care about learner-centered leadership? Why do you care about the work you're doing at Lyft Learning? Why does it matter? And then Monica, I'll tee you up and would love to hear your big why as well. So David. Well, thank you, Brian. Really appreciate being here with uh, both of you. Uh, why does this matter? Well, the voices of the youth are the most precious resource that we have it's essential that we open our ears and our minds to what they have to say as experts grounded in their own reality. And realities change so quickly as we've just experienced that we really must put our ear to the ground and give them opportunities, not only to uh, share what's going on in their, in their lives, their emotional world, also what are their goals, aspirations, what are their accomplishments, um, so that's why we're in the work to empower youth. And we've chosen to do that at Lyft Learning with technology that uh, embraces learner voice and choice and also puts essential skills at the heart of the matter of education because we really need um, learners to know and own what it is they're here to accomplish, be able to describe that, be able to view the world through their own accomplishment. It's a very strength-based model that has incredible benefits for long-term well-being of young people uh, as lifelong learners, as balanced human beings, able to maintain great relationships, uh, agency, accomplish a lot, uh, solve the pressing problems that we face as a global community as well. Thank you, David. There's a lot that I'll come back to you on with that in a few <laughs> minutes. and. Uh, Monica, my assumption is that uh, you have some similar perspectives, but also some unique ones in your partnership with uh, Lyft and also in your work there at Elevate Academy. Yeah. Um, it, again, Brian, thanks for having us. I almost didn't even sleep last night. I was so excited about this conversation today after reading through what we were talking about. And um, for us at Elevate, the real the real why behind what, we, what we've done, we work with mostly disenfranchised youth who you know, for lack of a better term, hated school um, and, and weren't successful in school. And um, so our system was, how do we create a system that's relevant and meaningful for kids so that they, again, can intrinsically become lifelong learners and enjoy learning again and get to a point where they understand the meaning and relevance behind it? So um, competency-based education, mastery-based education, um, as we call it here, was a vehicle to really meet the students where they were at give them the targets just beyond that, press them when we could press them, back off when we needed to back off, but really, really make it about the student because in all of the systems we'd worked in before, it wasn't really about the student, it was about getting through the content, getting through the curriculum, getting to the finish line. But once we got to that finish line, we'd left so much dust behind us that the students were flailing because of it. And so what CBE does you know, in our world and with our students is really flips it so they own their education. It's not something being done to them, it's something being done with them and for them. And you really see a student thrive and blossom when given that opportunity to own their education. And that's been really rewarding um, from our perspective. So I wanna push you both right out of the gate on a <laughs> Uh, an issue that I've dealt with this past year, 
this notion of assessment of or assessment for learning when we think about assessment next. Uh, our firm was called in to help a school district uh, look at their chromatic sort of point-based grading system, make recommendations on where they might go for assessment next. And I think around the country, there's this interesting dichotomy of parents who are really worried about points and GPA and merit outcomes. And I think what we all share in mind share that, you know, those uh, legacy pieces of point values and assessment of where somebody stands so that somebody else can make a decision or a judgment really does not set kids up for success when we talk about the knowledge, skills, and dispositions they need to compete in today's world. And there's evidence of this every year, tragically, of 40% of males uh, drop out, stop out, fail college because they were concerned about point values and making the cut or grade for scholarships. And then they had no tools of resilience, critical thinking, uh, essential skills that matter around problem solving or designing their own experiences or showing evidence that they created. And I know both of you are passionate about that. So you must encounter this. You must encounter parents, community members, doubters, naysayers. How do you weigh in on the assessment of or for learning debate? And let's let's start with Monica at the, you know, the level of people that are involved in your community and network and then we'll go to David and sort of his national lens and what he's seen across clients. Yeah, you know, this is this has been a really fun challenge for us. And um, when we describe fun, we're not saying yippee fun. It's been, it is a challenge, um, you know, and it's really a challenge even with the teachers that we're working with, especially when they've been teaching in a traditional model for several years um, that is just points-based and grades-based. And um, we always go back to the simple language is, are we grading for compliance? Are we grading for learning? And even as we're developing out our new systems, we're still on that teeter of, are we grading for compliance? Are we grading for learning? Because they've completed so much, but does completion mean learning? And so this, this notion of assessment really showing the parents and the community what a student is learning through the competency-based model. It's, it's challenging to get teachers there. It's challenging to get parents there. It's challenging to get higher education there. And so it's a continual conversation that we're having all the time about what really matters. What are we measuring? How do we measure it? Um, how do we communicate it? How do we, how do we get the stakeholders to understand that at the end of the day, a, a student that we're showing is proficient or, or has reached a mastery level in something means far more than a 90% or an 80% or 100%. And it's communicating to you actual learning rather than just compliance. And so we, we're spending countless hours on this. We're building three new campuses right now. And this is one of the biggest questions and concerns as we land in new communities is how do we communicate this and be proactive? Um, because it is a real challenge, but you're changing you know, hundreds of years. It's a big paradigm shift. And um, with any paradigm shift, you got to go back to the why of why you're doing it. And you really have to make people understand that it's about the heart of the matter of, of helping students own their journey and really see that they're getting to that next level of, of learning rather than just turning in a paper and getting it back with a grade on it. And so when you go back to the assessment, which is the root of that, it's all the feedback looping. It's all of the things that we have to do to get the kid to, to those proficiency levels. It's not just that timestamp. And that's a hard concept for people to um, get grasp. Thanks for that, Monica. Dave, what would you weigh in in terms of sort of the national dialogue and narrative around some of Monica's remarks? <laughs> well, Elevate Academy is doing a phenomenal job translating what could look like traditional outcomes, standards-based outcomes, uh, but reimagining what's underneath that so the feedback loop is meaningful. So the insight that is gained by the learners as they go through the journey is, um, is powerful and life-changing. Because when we think about assessment, who is it for? Traditionally, it's not been for the, the young learner. Um, when we think about what really moves us in our lives, the insight, the reflection, the aha moments that we get when we realize something important, that comes with its own validation. You actually don't need anything external for that to move in your life towards greater and greater accomplishment and health. And so how does assessment in a traditional system 
that's based around competition, as you mentioned in your question, right? How do our young people compete in the global world? If that's our starting point, I think we have some problems because as soon as we get into the competition mindset, we compare ourselves rather than look about that intrinsic motivation, intrinsic value of insight and experience. So how can we play the game with traditional outcomes, course grades, um, you know, uh, assignments, scores, all of that without losing the meaning. And, and Monica is, you know, one of the, the leaders in this, and there's other models emerging across the country that are really devoted to it. How does it happen? It's mindset change around the whole community. Uh, it's gradual. We have to have a lot of metaphors, a lot of PR, yeah. a lot of, uh, you know, painting the blue sky for people around health and wellness. And interestingly, COVID has helped us um, show how important that is, right? That we cannot afford to put more compliance on top of young learners who are feeling out of control based on events that are happening globally, uncertainty, um, disruption in their families and communities. We, we have to meet them where they are. We have to validate their struggles as really important learning, not try to put them away so we can get back to the assessment agenda. And uh, this is um, a very exciting moment, I think, because the national and global dialogue around meaningful assessment for learning that's not about compliance, that's about growth, is really front and center for people. Brian, let me add one, one let me tell you an anecdotal um, story about this too. When we first uh, started this work, you know, the shift for students was incredible. And one of the biggest, most fun ahas for the teachers, for us, for everything, because there's no time limit in our world. It's you learn and you continue to learn and you continue to learn, was the students that traditionally said, oh, forget it, I'm just going to take an F. And then all of a sudden it was like this stop gap where they realized, oh my gosh, these guys aren't gonna let me take an F. And that, that, that thing alone changed the culture and everything that we were doing within our system where students stepped back and went, I think number one, they realized people cared about them because you weren't gonna take an F. I think the second thing was, is they started to own it going, this is more than just about a letter on a paper. And so there's a lot of things that go into shifting that paradigm but that was one really aha for us and a simple one when a student could no longer make that comment, I'll just take an F. No, that's, that's a great uh, story and sort of consistent with, you know, some of the past work that, that Doug Reeves has done around no zero policies and some of the work that we see around, uh, you know, not giving students an academic death knell of these really low grades that they can't recover from, but giving them opportunities to really scaffold, you know, back up with what they can show and prove. So I want to switch gears a little bit here with uh, Monica White, CEO of Elevate Academy, and also David Lipkin, CEO of Lift Learning. Uh, this is Brian Setzer of Setzer Group, and we're uh, jumping into the ASU GSV dialogue and discussion feeds this week to really talk about assessment next and what we're learning around competency-based models, authentic models. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a little bit on the couch with both of you, and you're going to psychoanalyze my last two years, uh, and then feel free to, to jump in and share your own challenges. But as somebody who worked with Competency Works, Aurora Institute, INACOL, Rose Colby, the Pace Work in New Hampshire, you know, I spent a decade seeing the value of what you both do. And so prior to COVID, uh, people would often invite Setzer Group in to talk about uh, what are some alternative models to teaching and learning? What are some alternative models to assessment that we could consider? And, and I'm often bringing people like you for them to look at and sort of understand both at the practitioner level and also at the technology level and sort of say, you know, this, this is not only something that's, you know, uh, assessment next, this is actually happening and people are doing this and you should start and here's how you should walk and, you know, these types of things. So COVID comes along and my phrase on the couch would be the great exposure. It immediately showed that slapping traditional didactic lecture-based teaching online 
both exposed the poor quality of emergency remote learning. I don't even consider it online learning. We never got there. I, I would add that we're still not there. I know what quality online learning looks like. And most people took really bad traditional <laughs> pedagogy and stood it up online. And then they blamed online and they blamed the competency-based models for being too complicated and yet they really just stood up their same poor practice online. So I can say that because I'm peeking in across, you know, multiple states and multiple folks. But that didn't happen with you two. You two had different stories of what people experienced remote, hybrid, you know, with what they came to terms around because they weren't just trying to do a checklist on some learning management system. They weren't just trying to get the grade, Monica. They had to show evidence in different formats, different relationships. And my guess is that you saw different things. What I saw around most of the country was some superintendent going to a steak dinner with another superintendent and go, oh, you use Canvas, we'll use Canvas. How long did it take you to roll it out? A week? Oh, great, we'll roll it out in a week. Is it free? Yeah, it's kind of free. And I'm like, mm, free like a puppy. You've got to take <laughs> care of it and you got to make sure to nurture it. And you don't have a design for that puppy's life yet. So I'm curious what you saw in the great exposure that gives you hope. You feel like, you know, we were ready before, but this really gave us some, some new wind under our sails and then some challenges you still deal with that our listeners might be interested in. So open to either one who wants to take that question first. Well, I can start to field it because I'm going to talk a lot about David in this process too. And then if that's okay with you, David, but um, yeah, it was an interesting two years. And just to give some context, we started our school two years ago. So we felt like we were just hitting a stride. And let me back up because I think it's important for the context of where we got to COVID during COVID. When we started the school, we were using a platform and uh, my teachers came down to me and they're like, this does not work. You know, we, we built this school, we designed this, everything we want to do, and we're still taking round, round pegs and putting them into square holes and it doesn't work. And I challenged the teachers at that time because I really believe the root of where you get better is the boots on the ground. It's, I'm not in the classroom every day. I'm not working on the platforms every day, but I know enough to support the people that are and, and really to help facilitate and build. So the conversation flipped to them saying, okay, well, help me find a platform that will work. And um, they, found, they found David, they found Lyft. And he, even at that point in time, Lyft wasn't exactly where we needed it for, for our vision and what we wanted it to be too. So one of the greatest gifts of COVID is when we had some of the learning loss monies and stuff that came in, we jumped on the train with David right away and said, what will it cost us to build this platform to mirror exactly what we want kids to be able to see, be able to feel, be able to do, be able to track their learning, be able to do feedback looping, all of those kinds of things. And so we started this build out as quickly as we could. Um, to get it to where the kids needed it. And we're still, we're still refining and getting it better. But what that did for us during COVID was we had online virtual looping built in so that we could have feedback loop, get papers, mark them up, go back and forth with students continually. And students could see their targets and their rubrics and where they were going. And so we do a lot of John Hattie's work in visible learning. We, we've really studied that a lot to get to where we are and that visible piece to the students where they really understand and then you attach the relevance and meaning. We're able to do that through Lyft because of all everything we did beforehand. So once we moved to COVID, we'd been using the system in the school. It, I won't say it was easy. Nobody, nobody think this was easy. It was a lot of hard work and, and um, you know, God bless my teachers because they dove in and went all in on it. Um, but the system was in place to where the students really could still own their learning, even though we were in separate places. Now, was it grade A like it was live and in person? I would say absolutely not, but it was much better than it would have been had we not positioned ourselves to have this type of an online feedback looping and a way to assess kids uh, in a meaningful way um, virtually. There was a couple more layers to that that I think is important to know because assessment and the work we do and competency base is huge. The big, big piece though that matters I think more than anything in the world is the caring teachers in the room 
that we're able to keep track of every one of their students, follow up with their students, call home every day, make sure that they check in, all those kinds of things, because that layer that, that the teachers went for made all of the rest of the stuff make sense. Because at the end of the day, going back to the emotional piece David was talking about, it was very hard and a lot of people felt very lost and it elevate, we did everything in our power to make sure nobody felt lost, which made the learning even more possible. And in fact, I think somewhere we, we've done a write up of some of the agency that Monica's uh, middle schoolers took where they acknowledged their own gaps in learning. And so we don't wanna just mm -hmm. leave this behind. We wanna, you know, uh, check all the boxes of our own development. And uh, that was a voluntary step that they took. So testament to the relationships and that mindset change of them owning their own learning that, that uh, they surprised the educators with what they <laughs> they did yeah can we please go back and, and move further on this and that that when you get a student to want to go back a year and show that they have competency in an area that they're a year out of you've transformed that student into a lifelong learner and that that that's what it's all about so i really love the boots on the ground um or the moccasins on the ground you know um because we're only in this work as a technology provider to enable more of the philosophy and pedagogy that is is of interest to people. So I really want to get into very specific practices around competency-based instruction. Um, so what I see uh, primarily as a result of the schools using our learning system is that the kids have the same instructional design tools as the adults. So you don't have a top-down compliance LMS, you have a co-creative framework. And while a lot of the instruction is still, you know, fairly well teacher defined, just by having that big blue button that says, you know, learner, what do you wanna do? Where do you wanna take this learning? You sort of automatically have some flexibility and autonomy. And so what we saw for schools is that they were, instead of being a project-based learning school, they were now doing high quality interdisciplinary project-based learning that at its core needs to extend the learning into novel situations, right? That's where the mastery or the competency really comes from is mm -hmm. applying this. And so you need a system, a technology, an architecture, maybe it's just pencil and paper, but somewhere, please, in your system, have a way mm -hmm. for that learning to take to color outside of the lines, to go into the real world, to have kids get into that messy process of, I don't know how I'm gonna do it, but I'm gonna figure it out. Um, and so we saw the schools come back to us and say, we took our PBL practice to the next level uh, because you had the tools already there. Uh, so now if they were doing 75% of high quality PBL, now they're doing you know 150% and they're loving it. Um, the other really important practice is portfolio assessment, because mm -hmm. in a competency lens or a portfolio lens, it's really important to validate learning that happens in many spheres. And portfolio assessment is the only real way that I know of where you can collect a diverse body of evidence that touches on a given skill, validate it, count it, celebrate it. So um, we start to unsilo our minds around content areas and we unsilo our minds around classes and you need a tech architecture that is built for that. So we know dozens of schools who are so frustrated with workarounds, you know, they've got their LMS here and then they've got their spreadsheets here and they're trying to cross map, you know, uh, across these classes and disciplines and, and we're so thrilled because you know, five, six, seven years ago when we began iterating, this just seemed like the right thing to do for us is a holistic whole child approach to development. But now with, with COVID and the need to, you know, just meet learners where they are, um, the, the resonance of the portfolio approach to competency-based learning is really, um, also connected with the portraits of a graduate work that's just blossoming. Um, we see this as a very optimistic time uh, for uh, systems change. So there's a lot to unpack in both of your responses. <laughs> and I think 
this is one of the Damocles sword opportunities of competency-based learning where there's a tremendous opportunity to help people understand some of the things you both highlight. Uh, schools, districts, organizations can work with an ed tech company to bring about meaningful change and wonderful design because the very users, the end customers, the students, the teachers, the principals are working with the platform for a better outcome, right? Like I love that it's been vetted, et cetera. The second thing you bring out is something that I often see. And I think, you know, for our listeners, we're here with Monica White, CEO of Elevate Academy and CEO of David Lipkin of Lift Learning. You're going to go out on the floor at ASU GSV and you're going to see, you know, 27 reading products and 27 math products. And oftentimes Setzer Group is called into a district to say, Who, who's the best? And my first response to that is best in what? Like, what are you, what are you trying, what problem are you trying to solve? And then I do an audit of their tech tools and they've got 27 free tools, 27 paid tools, five tools they don't use anymore. And teachers are kind of saying enough. Like I, I can't be sort of this digital ninja that's flexing across free paid to get to the student outcomes that we need. So I share all of that to say, I wanna frame a question for you both. It's a little bit different than our pre-prep, but I love where this conversation is going. It's the notion of coherence between procedural learning, conceptual learning, application-based learning, and a market that still wants to fund and back procedural learning. Meaning that, meaning that, you know, hey, if we could get this great, great reading program, everybody would learn to read. What you two are suggesting though, and I think outright stating, is it's the coherence of all of those parts. It's the comprehensiveness of that that gives educators a way through. These are the tasks. This is the platform. These are the types of things that I can innovate on. So give us a look inside of the coherent relationship. Maybe Monica, walk me through that teacher in your mind that really understands the design, how to leverage it. It's really working in terms of authentic performance task and you feel great. And then David, if you could build on that from the standpoint of other practices that are like, this is the value add of coherence, right? Like. We're not all seeking to fund the next procedural based learning startup. We need to invest resources in coherence because those are the types of students that are going to be able to thrive in any outcome. So Monica, maybe from the teacher perspective. Absolutely. And I think there's every question you ask, there's so many layers uh, that it's, it's not overwhelming, but it's exciting. Um, you know, you say that one teacher pops into my mind immediately, but when we work, when we're working at Elevate, everything we do, we, we do project-based stuff because we're career tech ed school, and we have aligned all of our core content, math, science, English, and social studies with the trades. So students study everything within that trade that they're studying at the time. So everything they're learning has relevance and meaning as closely as we can tie it. Um, so we have that piece where there's coherence that's brought to us by the platform because we're able to, to you know, meld all of, the, all of the content within the platform to get to the end project and kids can see everything um, from the beginning and know exactly where they're going, what's expected of them, help build it, help move. So then when we go next level, this is, when, this is next level stuff that we're getting ready to do. And I've got one teacher that's really cracked the code and going for it. And you're seeing uh, the growth in his students last, last year, even through COVID was, I would, I would pair it up against anybody's in the state. It was that good. But what it allows us to do, and it, you know, once, it, once that teacher's ready to take it to the next level, um, we kind of relate it almost back to uh, football. I'm a I'm longtime coach, been married to coaches for years, right? So these coaching analogies make sense to me. But in football, when you go to football practice, you have team time and you have individual time. And that is a given probably in any football stadium in America from the professional level down to, you know, your optimist levels. We've kind of, he took that philosophy, brought it into the classroom with everything that we did. And team time is when we really nailed down the competencies that we were going to do as a team, as a whole school, as a class, right? Then he was able to, through the program and how we're working with Lyft, to layer on top of that 
all of the individual skills that each individual student was missing to be able to really get them to the next level, either with, you know, on that team level or even go above that. And the same thing going the other way. Maybe they have all the team skills and we need to push them to that next level above. And so from the teacher's point of view and the way that we're building out Lyft is we've got these competency banks where we can pull them out and customize them. So each individual learner can really glean from exactly what they need. And it's not just this cookie cutter approach, like you said, um, to what's the next tech innovation that's going to make a difference because there's not one size fits all anywhere in education. You'll never find it. I mean, my kids are a product of um, the big direct instruction, everybody on the same page in the classroom next to them uh, to learn how to read in elementary. And they both hate reading so bad, even though, even though they're really high performing students, you put a book in front of them and they run the other way. And so can they read? Absolutely. But do we teach them to read for the right reasons? not even close. And so when we're looking at this team individual approach that's so focused on the student as well as the, the standards and the competencies that we, you know, we've identified that we believe students need to learn and be able to do, that's the approach that really gets us next level and really makes it about the learner. Um, Great so insights. I, Dave, I think Chris, your, your follow-up. Thank you. Um, so coherence is the question that all the education leaders that we've been working with over the last few years have, have come forward with. And we like to be provocative in our, in our uh, consultative approach to technology integration um, and systems change. So we typically work for many years with our school part and district partners to uh, look at their vision uh, ask the hard questions, share our experience of where we've seen schools trying to stand up competency-based models or personalized learning models, where have they struggled? And so we ask those hard questions. Is your framework really ready? Do you really know what this is gonna look like in practice day to day? Um, are, are teachers ready to orient their feedback around these essential skills rather than the grade on the assignment? And so coherence, is more and more desired because now it's sort of survival for schools, especially with COVID. They realized, wow, we've got such, um, we've got our traditional teachers that are reluctant to change their mindset. We've got some that are sort of dipping their toes. We've got some that, that are championing and all in. And they realized that that was really holding them back, not just from outcomes for, for learners, which is certainly true, but just from them being able to say, let's put the struggle behind us. Let's be a competency-based, project-based, real-world learning school, right? And what is it gonna to take to thrive in that and stand on that? So they come to us with a lot of coherence questions. And the way that's mirrored in our software is that we engineered flexibility across all the levels. So whatever your framework is, um, you, can organize it in some very different ways mm -hmm. to help different instructional models um, um, take shape where appropriate. So um, as an example, those point solutions, Brian, that you spoke about that are around say reading scores or something like that, those are very valid. I hesitate to present an either or choice to any school. Um, let those be interventions when needed. Let them be part of your curriculum. But what's your container that answers the why? In Monica and Elevate Academy's work, they have a why statement for every single standard and skill that they're asking their learners to tackle. Uh, and it's tied to trades. I mean, you can't get more relevant than that. These are kids that you know need a pathway to success. They need to understand why. They need the motivation and they're getting it. So um, I don't see it as, you know, this technology or that technology. I see it as what is your overarching framework? Um, and do you have a tool that can hold that and then allow different models within that to flourish, um, even if they need a slightly different treatment around instructional design? No, that's, that's really great. I. I want to tie it back to the John Hattie comment that Monica made. You know, if, if we took John Hattie, Marzano, Selecti, Dylan William, all of these people and said, um, 
hey, what are the top five high yield strategies that all of them sort of espouse, right? And let's mm -hmm. say that one of them is clarifying learning intention. Well, can you do that on a face-to-face -face boots on the ground? Can you do that online? Absolutely. Can you do it with a point solution? Can you do it with a coherent solution? Absolutely. And so the, the, the skill set that's required for Monica is uh, conductor, orchestrator, coach. How do I, you know, put all of those pieces together? <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. that people can say, oh, okay, I, I get the framework and I can get started. And then when you introduce technology into it, I have a saying that it takes, you know, 21 times for something to become a habit online. You know, people that hate technology are all of a sudden great at online banking because that's where their money is and they've learned how to do it. Or they can operate a, a kiosk in a grocery store because they've built that habit or that capacity, right? So it takes a while to manage this change. So I want to segue that to, to a question you know, is it your point of view collectively, first starting with Monica, then with David, that, you know, people need some time up front to understand the options, wrestle with their own bias, begin to explore. And then it sounds like you both would advocate for treating them as a student, actually taking them through the experience that they're going to have to, um, you know, design, lead, teach, etc. And then, to give them some small wins? Or uh, did you both kind of go fast in this in some ways and then kind of back up and say, man, you know, I, we went too fast there. We should have spent some more upfront time. We should have really socialized people to this. Because I think leading that to a question, a lot of people will say, this sounds really hard. Isn't it just easier to buy something? And if I buy <laughs> something, won't that take care of it? And that goes back to my comments before, which I really appreciate the push, David. Like, I don't want to make it binary either, but I also want to lift listeners, no pun intended, out of this notion that uh, if I just pay for it, it'll come, it'll happen. When I know you both believe that it's a it's an amalgam of that process. So, so maybe to frame that as a question, sorry for the layers again, Monica, uh, how do you manage this change? What have you learned? What are some key things that listeners and leaders could say, okay, I've got it. First three months, I need to do this. First year, I need to do this. So let me start with, if, if you were to interview my teachers and anybody can anytime, they love to talk, but the first thing they would tell you is the last couple of years of doing this work is the hardest work they've ever done. They'll, they'll tell you that. They will say it is the hardest. They will also follow that up, every single one of them, and say, but it's the most rewarding work I've ever done. And the reason behind that is, is um, having, an, and I've been in education and, and long enough to see several iterations of it. Um, you know, when we went back into NCLB times and we made everything a benchmark system, right? We changed how we did everything. The principal and the, all of a sudden became the, the educational leader which is great. And their throat was there to choke if anything went bad. And then we saw the trickle down effects of how that worked, right? Um, and, and, I, and I was in the midst of that and part of all, of all of that stuff as it was going on. Part of my learnings through that and part of the development of Elevate and getting to this competency-based model was really a shift in going, I don't know everything. I haven't even been in a classroom since 2007. I can't even act like I belong in a classroom anymore without feeling like a complete imposter. So to do this work, we had to really um, reinvent that notion that the true experts in the room are the teachers in the classroom that are with the kids every day. I mean, they went, they've been through the training, they're with the kids, they know exactly what's going on. So when we did this, it really, and as we continue to do this, because I don't ever see a stop point in this. I, keep, I see it keep developing and morphing and growing, and the more we learn, the better it's going to get. And um, so with that, the work really had to be done more through the teachers and with the teachers than it did from a top-down um, sort of way. I don't think it would have ever worked had it been top down. But through the collaboration lens, it, I mean, we had the framework and the understanding and the box that David talked about of where we wanted to go.
But then the actual building and developing, that all happened with the boots on the ground, people that actually had to do it. And so through that process, you see the buy-in come in much quicker. You see the struggles are shared with everybody. It's not like one person gets it and one doesn't, and then you create all this collusion. Everybody was in the same boat, moving the same direction, figuring it out. So I think that, that was, that's a really powerful thing that I think of all the learning we did is you've got to empower the teachers to develop the content, to develop the, the help develop the platform, to all of those kinds of things. Now, when we, when we developed it, like I said, the box and the framework was there, but then everything that we put in the box was all teacher developed, and then it keeps morphing and getting better from there. So it is hard work and it's super passionate work, but if you involve people at the right level, um, and really make them a part of the process rather than it being done. They're just, the teachers are just like students. They want, they want to do it for, you know, everybody wants to create, everyone wants to, wants to be a part of something great. And so make people part of something great. And it becomes even greater than it ever would have in my own head. Um, and I'll give you a fun example of that. Now that we're growing, we've actually hired a curriculum person that's working directly with David on our next iterations. And she came in the other day and showed me everything she was doing. And, and, and I said, oh, this is, this is great. I said, but you're talking to the wrong person. You need to get in the classroom and grab a few teachers and get their opinion. And then as soon as we get students in the building, get their opinion from that side. And then you can make decisions going forward. And so it's really keeping ourselves as leaders accountable to really know where that work needs to happen as well. So we would love to see this to be big tent education redesign, right? Competency-based, personalized, uh, learner-led, learner-driven pathways. Um, and how do you how do you do that when the change is so hard? Uh, when it's really about hearts and minds and mindsets and mm -hmm. practices and bell schedules and you know access uh, to technology, uh, particularly around you know equity gaps. Like, so thank you very much for mentioning how hard the work is. We had lived through some of that change management before we got into this business of being a technology provider. So we built in the change process into the tool, uh, which was a lot more difficult than building a point solution. But we understood that if we want to have the impact and elevate learning and opportunity, uh, for the next generation, we had to respect the change process and the difficulty. So what does that look like in the technology architecture? You can see signs of sort of gradual um, iteration where maybe year one is just translating your existing curriculum. Uh, into Lyft and delivering it that way. But year two, you design three quarters of it and hand off the last quarter of the experience to the kids. Um, maybe year three is when you really get to your portrait of a graduate and get that um, dialed in to the point where you're ready to operationalize that. So what we've done in terms of our onboarding and partnership model is to be to ask the hard questions, to not go too fast, because we've seen the pushback that happens when you launch a CBE model into the community before the community is ready. And that just sets back the movement. Um, and sometimes it can be hard to recover. So we will pace the change with our partners and we'll say, we don't think your, your framework is quite there. You know, what, what's it going to take? Do you have the PLC model right now to do this work authentically? If not, that's okay. Work on that. What can we do together? And sometimes we'll just say, this isn't the time to partner because you've got some foundational work. Uh, CBE is not the next shiny thing. Um, you've got, you know, leadership alignment to work through. You, you may have, you know, some, some um, hiring that you need to do. Uh, in order to really be ready for this. And we suggest you go methodically. Um, we're pretty impatient because we know the power of CBE, uh, but we we also know the, the risks of going too far too fast. Um, we're particularly excited about some work that's unfolding with, um, with one of the New York BOCES, where they're spending a year 
just using the platform so all the educators in all of those districts can do their professional development through a portfolio assessment model, through a project-based challenge and inquiry model. And we love that approach because when teachers live through it, um, then it makes a lot more sense when they're gonna apply it in the classroom. They see the aha, the value that, that they personally had and they're much more on board. So that gradual social socialization also has its place. Mm -hmm. Thanks to you both. I'm gonna um, remind our audience here that we're here with Monica White, uh, CEO of Elevate Academy in Idaho and also David Lipkin of Lift Learning. Um, one of the things that I wanna do in the remainder of our time is talk a little bit about assessment future, right? Uh, here's what I'm seeing on the tea leaves and I would wonder your reactions about where all of this is going to build on to Monica's comment that this probably doesn't stop. It, it keeps iterating on itself. Um, Chris Deedy at Harvard has written about the 60-year curriculum. Rich DeMillo at Georgia Tech talks about learning for a lifetime and having a lifetime portfolio. We've seen in the last few years the explosion of micro-credentials and the unbundling of higher education and K-12, what we could easily see is womb to tomb, cradle to grave, uh, multiple options throughout your lifespan to show evidence of learning. And employers are starting to get on this train as well. If you've followed the work at Guild Education, you know that employer partnerships are really strong in terms of, you know, I'm not gonna pay for you to go back to Get a master's degree, but I would pay for you to upskill and I would pay for you to learn more and show evidence of that. And so platforms around the world from edX to Coursera to Udacity provide nuance around this. But my personal opinion is coherence is still the issue. How do we know that this person who's amassed a different set of skills, maybe even 27 or 35 skills, has the wraparound knowledge to solve for problems, projects, work on interpersonal or critical thinking skills. So I think, you know, assessment next is really going to be about when I present to you my dossier or my resume or you present yours to mine, there's true evidence of learning throughout the life cycle. And so I'm curious hearing that description where each of you think this is headed. And only because we uh, have just a few minutes, uh, we'd love to give you each the last word. Hey, it's funny you say that. I was working with a group of colleagues the other day and we were joking about, we need to write our unresume because we're probably where we are because of everything we've screwed up more than we are because of everything we've done successfully, which goes to the point that screwing up is where you know learning really occurs and happens and what gets us where we need to be. But, you know, I think there's, there are some levels to that because I think we, as a society, especially with technology, we're becoming so much more skill-based, whether that's in the workforce, whether it's, you know, online, doesn't matter where that is, it's skill-based. And like with the work we're doing with David, our goal is when a student graduates as a senior, they do have that portfolio that they can walk out with real authentic samples of the work they've done. So when they work into the, into they walk into their, you know, job interviews and things like that, they've got examples. And one of the places we learned this, and when we started this journey, we went to every industry we could in our local community, and we met with the CEO or the high up manager of everyone and said, what do you need out of the workforce in the next five to 10 years? And we asked that question over and over for months. And what we got to in, in a lot of the industry areas was people were super frustrated. Employers were super frustrated because like a kid would come out of school with a welding certificate but couldn't even turn on a welder. So they're like going, how does this happen? And we're cert certificating students with, he goes, let's be honest. You guys take a week off for Christmas or two weeks for Christmas, a week for spring break. We know nobody's doing anything during homecoming week. And he adds up all the days that probably there really isn't any authentic learning going on. He goes, so you're telling me this student is a certified welder and they probably have 10 hours of true welding under their belt. you know." And so that was a really critical aha for us 
to go, how do we really show beyond even this certification process that learning is authentic, which loops us back to the portfolio work we're, we're getting ready to put into Lyft with David so the student can leave, but now they can walk in and say, this is what I've welded. And they've had pictures and they have diagrams and they can explain it and show it. Then all of a sudden we're looking at an authentic assessment rather than a certification because I studied for a test you know, enough to pass it when it's written, when the skill is actually tactical. So I think we're going to see this move and shift quite a bit over the next few years of how do we really show that we know and understand things uh, to move to the next level. But I also think that that's really exciting work. Thank you for that, Monica. Um, this is a really, I have mixed feelings about this question um, because if we're not careful, we make school to work pipelines that are so technical and credentialed and micro-credentialed and sort of cut into little pieces and the promise of blockchain and stackable and portable is so mm -hmm. seductive. Is there a, a risk that we could lose the whole person there? And are the most valuable experiences those collaborative human team-based approaches where each individual finds creative ways to add value to a system, whether it's a welding shop or, you know, a think tank or, or anything else. So um, I don't really have a, a stake in the ground on this one. I think we need to let it unfold. I understand the value, and, which is why I built a platform that <laughs> you get a portfolio for every competency that matters. Uh, it's still up to the organization and institution to decide what matters. Um, we work with a number of CTE oriented schools and uh, it's great to the extent that they make the learning sing <laughs> and matter, right? Um, so I believe there'll be plenty of product providers that do sort of school to work pipeline stuff and upskilling and I do believe that it matters. It's not either or. Um, but it always comes down to a question of values. What's the future we want to inhabit? What's the, you know, what's the experience we want to have as human beings co-creating, collaborating, solving real problems? Um, and I do think that that takes a little bit of effort to force yourself into those value-based discussions and then walk the talk. Um, so I'm encouraging back to how difficult this can be. There's that personal reflection, but the power of each person within a system, even a traditional system to raise their voice and say, hey, why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. Whose assessment is this anyhow? And do we really need this whole thing? Even if you come back to a fairly traditional model, that's okay, you've asked the question and change will happen as a result of that. Fantastic uh, to spend time with you both. A reminder to our ASU GSV audience that uh, we will have a replay of this premier event uh, tomorrow evening and we'll also be uh, providing a supercut of some of the responses so you can show those small vignettes to your staff, your team, your faculty, your investment group to really understand the nuance of this discussion around assessment next. want to thank our um, panelists tonight, Monica White, CEO of Elevate Academy, and also David Lipkin, CEO of Lift Learning. We will see you on the uh, Twitter feeds around ASU GSV, and we'll also see you throughout the year. Thank you so much for joining the Barriers for Breakfast Innovators uh, livecast today. And uh, I know I'll see both of you in the post green room, but uh, thank you for your time today. Mm -hmm.